We are here at New Hope Covenant Church uh, and community. The reason we're here is uh, because I want to introduce you to my friend, uh, Quentin Mumphrey. He's the pastor of this church here on the southeast side. And uh, actually, you founded the church almost five years ago, so a church planner, um, the lead pastor here. But I think, I think we first really kind of met when New Thing decided to uh, form a church planning network. And I distinctly remember... Um, and being impressed by your understanding of the, of the city of Chicago, particularly the history of Chicago, but then also your passion for churches and church planning and wanting to live like Jesus. And so you, you may not know this, but I remember kind of like trying to make sure my chair was near yours <laughs> <laughs> or trying to be at your table so I could kind of lean into what you're seeing. So uh, anyway, thanks for having us at your place here. Well, welcome. Uh, welcome to the South Side. And uh, thank you all for coming out here and making the trek. I thought a good place to start because uh, the folks at the community don't know you like I do is maybe just tell us your story, a little bit about uh, where you grew up, what your family was like, where you went to school, and what you're doing now. Well, I grew up on, here on the south side of Chicago. I live in South Shore currently, but I grew up in the Auburn-Gresham community. Parents have been living there. My dad's gone to be with the Lord now, but my mom still lives in the house that we grew up in, and have, they've been living in that house for about 47, 48 years now. Um, of course, they bought it before I was born. Um, they were actually like the second black family on the block. They witnessed kind of what we call the white flight in the 1970s. Uh, so I grew up in that neighborhood, went to Whitney Young High School in the city of Chicago. So pretty diverse school, but majority black. Um, did my undergrad at UIC, University of Illinois Chicago. Went to seminary at North Park Theological. Uh, so I am a Chicagoan through and through, um, but I have Southern roots. Uh, my grandparents on my mom's side were part of the Great Migration. They moved to Chicago from uh, Arkansas and Tennessee. And my dad is actually part of the, was, was part of the Great Migration. He moved here from Georgia, so got a lot of Southern roots. And so I've kind of come into the history of Chicago and just overall black history from a lot of different angles. Yeah, both personally and then, of course, your, your Absolutely. parents. And, yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, I'll tell you what, let, let's, let's, let's kind of start talking about kind of perspective here, too, because we have a lot in common. Um, mm -hmm. We both grew up in Christian homes. Mm -hmm. Um, we're, I think we're both Bulls fans. Yes. Sox yes. fans. Yes. That's good. Otherwise, we'd have to end this interview That's right now. That's right. Yeah, right. <laughs> Be on the right side of history. <laughs> and um, um, we're both pastors. But there are some things that are different. Um, where you grew up as a black kid on the south side, I grew up as a white kid in the south suburbs. Mm -hmm. I would love for you to just kind of reflect, what do you think were some of the differences in the experiences uh, maybe we had? Just knowing, you know, what I know about the South Suburbs, especially at the time, which you would have been growing up there, the level of diversity is obviously very different, I'm sure, at that time. But growing up on the South Side of Chicago, I grew up in, you know, by the time I was born, the neighborhood was pretty much black. One of the things about growing up on the South Side of Chicago, and but also being in diverse settings at times, is you have to learn to what we call code switch. What was that again? Code switch. Okay. Code switch is where you learn that there's one way that you conduct yourself when you're in the neighborhood. And then there's another way when you conduct yourself and when you're in more diverse settings or around white folk. Oh, really? So it's kind of like flip a light switch in a room. So, so we call it cold switching. Did you have to flip the switch when I walked in? No. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> you, no. No. Um, you know, I, I think one of the things about cold switching is as you get older, you, you find settings and people who you can, you're able to be more of your authentic self with. Now, when I'm in certain professional settings, or if I meet people for the first time, then yeah, I make cold switch. But if I'm around, you know, family, friends, or just in the neighborhood, there's a different way in which you conduct ourselves. Um, but part of cold switching is survival, um, because you know, grow up on, on, up on the south side of Chicago, you have to be aware of your surroundings. Uh, you know, we know about the history of violence on the south side of the city, so. You can't be naive to those realities. You know, I grew up taking public transportation at times, right? So going to school on, on the bus and the train line and everything. So you got to be aware of those realities. But also, um, when you're in settings um, where there are people who don't look like you or come from your background, you've got to know how to communicate with them. What about some of the other experiences, too? Maybe you had, um, I'm, I, man, I, if it would have happened, I would remember. I don't remember any racial slurs being thrown my way. I don't remember ever being afraid. I have regret when I get pulled over by police, but not necessarily mm -hmm. being afraid. Mm -hmm. I got two boys. I never had a conversation with them about what to do. Well, I'll start off with, you know, even my parents' generation. You know, my parents were, grew up in the Jim Crow era. Especially my dad grew up in southern Georgia, so, and he moved from that to here in Chicago, which, you know, people would think, you know, northern racism is not as bad as it is in the south, but it is very much 
as bad um, in different ways, in more subtle ways. So I had the talk early. I got the talk from my parents early about racism, about what it means to be um, a black kid uh, in this country, uh, which who would one day become a black man in this country. Do you remember like some of the specifics of what your dad said? Well, one of the things that my dad would say is you have to, one, never see yourself as less than another man. So, you know, my dad was very much Southern. He was also former military. He fought in the Korean War. Uh, so he was very much the disciplinarian, the strong. You look a man in the eye, you shake their hand firmly, you know, you keep your word, those kind of things. Um, but he also talked about things about trust and knowing how to conduct yourself. You're around police, you know, keep your hands visible, things like that. So there was some lessons that I was taught um, you know, making sure that you don't, there are certain neighborhoods that we were taught don't go into, uh, definitely not at night. Um, so those were just some lessons that we were, you know, we kind of taught. My older siblings, you know, would give the same kind of lessons. You know, my family, uh, as I mentioned, they were one of the first black families in the area that they moved in. So my older siblings, you know, I wasn't born at the time, but, you know, they got chased, you know, they got called the N-word, they got bottles thrown at them, all kind of things that happened. Um, you know, as being one of the only black families in the neighborhood at the time. Um, by the time I was born, that didn't happen because it was a majority black neighborhood. Uh, I did not get as much of the direct um, racial experiences, but I've had many, uh, well, I did, I have had some direct experiences. One of the times I was, actually when I was in seminary, uh, working on my master's and at I North was- Park. At North Park. But I also worked for the university. And um, there was one weekend we took a group of students uh, on a trip and I was driving a university van one of the uh, university vans and returned the van to the, the van pool lot. And um, as I was getting out of the van, I was getting my bags because we had been away. I think we had, it was a, like a weekend trip. So as I was getting my bags out of the car, you know, it's taking me a few minutes to gather all my things to go to my car um, to get out of the van. But before I could, by the time I closed the van up, three police cars pulled into the lot and officers jumped out. And they told me, don't move, put your hands on the van. So I'm like, what's going on here? And they said that um, we got a report that someone was trying to steal a van at this parking lot. Um, they said they saw a black man trying to steal a van. I said, well, I was driving this van. I had the keys to it. I'm an employee of the university. So I had to show my university ID and went through this whole process of them validating that what I was saying was true. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but it was, you know, you see a black guy in a van, he's got to be stealing it. How, how unusual is that for, let's say, the other black men in your church? Oh, it's, it's common. <laughs> you, know, um, you know, and then that's, that's one of the more direct instances, but you also have what we call microaggressions. And microaggressions are experiences such as, you know, people crossing the other side of the street. Um, is, well, that's very common. Them. Oh, it's very common. Myself, and if you talk to any of the men in my church, um, getting on an elevator. You get on an elevator, um, there could be three or four other people on the elevator, and this is before social, social distancing, right? <laughs> um, you get on the elevator, and all of a sudden, everyone just goes to the other side of the elevator, or even get off. I've had that happen numerous times, where people just get off the elevator. Um, uh, those uh, you walk down the street, and you hear car doors locking. Um, and I'm, talking, I'm not talking about when I'm in a hoodie, I'm talking about when I'm dressed like I am now. Mm -hmm. You know, many times, and I did it, I, I'm, I'm probably, dress a little more casual now. I wear gym shoes and stuff more now that I'm a little older. But when I was in my 20s, I wore, and uh, you know, folks that know me for a while, I, I've worn jackets a lot intentionally uh, because I was often in settings where there weren't a lot of black people. And so uh, sometimes a jacket or a certain kind of shirt makes you less threatening. But even then, I mean, I can dress like this and walk down the street and I hear car doors locking or women clutching their purses or people pulling their children the other side. So um, those kind of microaggressions are very common. Uh, I remember um, even in undergrad, I was in a, one class and um, I remember conversations with a white student who called affirmative action reverse racism. And um, they were making this assumption that black students went to college because of affirmative action, not because of our intellect. So um, just those kind of things, those kind of experiences, they were common. How about let's, let's bring it up to, I mean, like the last 10 weeks, because I mean, I think most of us would say, and this is a term that's used a lot, unprecedented. I mean, it's just been kind of crazy. We got the pandemic, and then on top of that, you got 15 plus percent unemployment, and then uh, you have the George Floyd killing, 
it's just, it's been a really a time that's of upheaval kind of for both our communities, but also our whole country. I, I like specifically, again, think about where, you know, communities, 10 locations are, and kind of your community, from your perspective, how have, how have those things impacted both you and, and your church community? Well, there's an old saying that when America catches a cold, black America catches pneumonia. Mm. Um, because every social ill or challenge is magnified in the context of predominantly black communities. So for example? So for example, if the national unemployment rate is hovering around six or seven percent, at any given time, it's guaranteed that in uh, predominantly black communities, it'll be somewhere above 12 percent, 15 percent at least. I was talking to my, uh, the girl that cut my hair yesterday at Sports Clips. She was Hispanic and we were having the conversation about race and she, and she was like, no, uh, it haven't, hasn't impacted me as much. She said there have been some, but she did tell me, she said, uh, her boyfriend is African American. And mm -hmm. she said, we both went in just as kind of an experiment to, to apply for a job. She said, I went in and they gave me a job and he went in and the same job and they told, they told him, oh no, we're not hiring. Mm -hmm. Those are common. Uh, and it's interesting because I've talked to other people who either have black friends or, and I've even talked to some interracial couples who have had these experiences where, um, you know, those kind of things happen. Or even in stores, you know, one of the things that is common, you don't talk about microaggressions in stores, is being followed. Um, you know, I ask some, of my, some white folks that I know sometimes, you know, how often do you get followed around a store when you go in? They're like, never, uh, you, know, or, you know, rarely. Um, but it happens regularly, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I think some of those factors, but then when you start talking about factors around health, around economics, um, those factors get magnified in, in black communities. Part of it does go to health care and the history of health care disparities in this country. There's a long history of health care disparities. Uh, there's a long his history of health care uh, malfeasance. I mean, you can go all, we can go all the way back. We don't have the time now, but we can go back to the, the Tuskegee experiments where African-American men were, were intentionally injected with syphilis. Um, to see what would happen to them. There were, um, mm -hmm. a, a one of the, actually I don't remember the doctor's name, but one of the, he's considered one of the fathers of modern gynecology. He did experiments on slave women um, to understand the female anatomy and would actually mutilate them. So there's a long history of, you know, healthcare with black folks. And one of the things is people understand, well, how come, you know, black men don't go to the doctors often? Well, there's a long history there. But then there's also disparities in healthcare coverage. African-Americans are twice as likely to have either no coverage or inadequate coverage on health care. When you look at the quality of hospitals in mostly black communities, uh, for instance, the south side of Chicago has one of the highest um, rates of violence in the country, but yet we uh, only have one trauma center at the University of Chicago, and that was more recent when it became a trauma center. But then you talk about things like um, pre-existing conditions. So one of the, fa one of the factors with the, with the coronavirus pandemic was diabetes, hypertension, and those kind of factors make you at a higher risk to contract the virus. Well, African Americans have much higher rates of those pre-existing conditions, uh, and a lot of it goes to things like um, diet, nutrition, exercise. So when you look at most of our communities, there are not a lot of uh, park walking trails. There are not a lot of you know, places to exercise. But then you talk about food. Uh, most of the communities that on the south and west side are food deserts, where, which means they don't have a, hel a lot of access to healthy produce. They have little corner stores here and there, but not a lot of major grocery stores. Very, uh, you know, there's few, that's been a big fight of a lot of the activists, but not only are they food deserts, they are food swamps, which means there is an overabundance of fast food and junk food. Mm. So when you look at those factors, and then uh, you talk about the, you know, the representation of those who are essential workers, who couldn't work from home, uh, people who work in grocery stores, people who are delivery work drivers and things like that. A lot of African Americans are overrepresentation in those occupations. So when you factor in all of these things, it, it, uh, it adds up as to why um, black folks were 70% of the cases. Well, and then, I mean, the more, more recent days, uh, the George Floyd killing, I got a text from my, my buddy Doug, our buddy mm -hmm, Doug, mm -hmm. and he's like, hey, uh, Q's on Facebook Live, and I went to your Facebook Live, and it was you and Frank and some of the other guys uh -huh. who were actually out on the street. You want yeah. to talk about what's going on there? Sure, so everyone's heard about the George Floyd killing, and uh, one of the things that happened was, of course, what started as protests, but then in mo many cities around the country, it, it devolved into looting and violence. And, you know, I mean, I was talking to some elders who were saying they haven't seen this kind of rioting and looting and everything since the 1960s, which obviously I wasn't born, but 
after Dr. King was assassinated in 1968. So what happened was on Sunday when a lot of the looting was happening, I was getting messages about, you know, different neighborhoods and communities getting hit, which again, our communities, especially on the south side of Chicago, they're already economically challenged. They're already, you know, a lack of businesses and African-American business owners were largely passed over in a lot of the federal relief that came. And so they're, they're more vulnerable. So talked to another pastor friend of mine, Will Hall, and he said, um, I've been getting calls from some of the business owners. Uh, what do you think of just getting some guys together and going out and just standing in front of some of the black businesses to protect them? So that's what we did on Sunday afternoon. So that when you saw the Facebook Live, we were out there uh, on 47th and Cottage just trying to protect. Uh, we were able to protect about six or seven of the businesses within that within a certain block radius over there. Uh, but there was looting happening all around, glass breaking. Dr. King said many years ago that riots are the language of the um, are the language of the unheard. That, and so, um, you know, sometimes one of the frustrations that I hear many times is, you know, in America, people were offended and upset with Colin Kaepernick for taking a knee, uh, and they made it about the flag when that was not the issue in which he was taking a knee in the first place. So, if people are uncomfortable with peaceful protests, then people resort to violent mm -hmm. protests which, again, I don't condone violence, but we, we cannot go straight to the looting and ignore the murder. We cannot go straight to the violence and not look at some of the factors that have created the circumstances and the climate in which this stuff was able to be birthed. So talk to me, or talk to us really as a pastor then. So there's a lot of those systemic things that we've, we've started talking about. What's a biblical kind of response to kind of those systemic injustices and racism that we see? Micah 6, 8 asks the question, what does the Lord require of thee? You know, to, to love justice, to act mercifully, and to walk humbly with your God. And I believe that in that scripture, it gives us kind of a framework. You know, Dr. King often talked about, let justice roll down, like in quoting the scriptures with like a mighty stream. Uh, there is, you know, many times we look at social justice as being separate from a biblical framework, or we look at it as that's just a social issue. But it is as much a social issue as it is a biblical issue. You know, even when Jesus in Luke 4, when he goes in and he quotes the prophet Isaiah and said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, you know, to set at liberty those that are bruised. Uh, those aren't just spiritual implications. Those are some natural things. He talked about liberty, right? Th those, are, those are principles. Liberty doesn't just apply to us being free from our sins. Liberty also applies to being free from systemic oppression around us. So there is biblical framework in the scriptures. Um, you know, much of the Old Testament was about justice, right? Oh, yeah. You know, Israel, uh, Israel came from a context of oppression and the Lord always reminded them, I'm the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. I'm the Lord who brought you out of oppression. I'm the Lord who brought you out of bondage. But yet here in America, we tell black people get over slavery. But we read the scriptures and the Lord always reminded them, I'm the God who delivered you from slavery. So there's a disconnect there. You know, we, we, we have this kind of westernized biblical view that says um, all that matters is me being forgiven of my personal sins. And, and I'll just move on and be happy with life. But being washed of my personal sins is one thing. Um, but w even when Jesus talks about the parable of the Good Samaritan, it was the, it was the priest and the Levite who walked by. But the Samaritan who didn't look like him and who didn't come from his context that helped him. And, and so that, that goes to the question of who is my neighbor? So there's a biblical framework for it. And I think we have to challenge ourselves and I say we, meaning the body of Christ as a whole, uh, black churches, white churches, everyone, we have to challenge ourselves to live this thing out. That's so good. In our church, and my hunch is probably in yours, we have some police officers who, I mean, that is a, that's a calling almost. Mm -hmm. It is. And it's, I mean, and they put their lives on the line and they, they protect us and, and those kind of things. So it creates this weird tension where you hear those stories of Laquan McDonald or George Floyd or you know Eric Garner, you hear those stories, but then you also have police officers who you know they take this very seriously and, and they, they want to do their job and they and they're not doing it for the money. They love their community. Do you feel that same tension? Uh, I do, uh, and, and I you know I understand. I, there are police officers who I know. Um, I have two uncles that were retired Chicago police um, and other family members that are currently working in law enforcement. So I understand the tension that they feel and even the conflict, you know, f especially for those who are African-American. To be an African-American police officer and you're patrolling a, a protest, which part of you feels like you should be part of, mm 
that's a tension, right? Yeah. Um, and even some of them have had to encounter racism on police forces. So I think there is a definite tension that many law enforcement feels. But one of the things about that tension that has to happen, because one of the things that I hear in the narrative often is every time a killing or happens like George Floyd, like Eric Garner, is, well, you know, those are some bad apples, um, and that's not a reflection of all law enforcement. Uh, well, while that may be true, what we need is to hear more of the good apples speak up. Mm. What we need is to hear more of the good apples call the bad apples on the carpet, um, because silence can be, if, if you are silent, you're complicit. For police officers who have good hearts, and I would just say this, to any police officer who wants to do right, who, want, who has a good heart, and who wants to effectively serve their community, and who does not want to be a representation of the quote unquote bad apples, you have to reconcile the history of law enforcement. When you go back to the history of law enforcement, the first people to wear badges in the United States were the slave catchers, who, who would chase and arrest slaves who ran away. So the history of black folk and law enforcement in this country goes far back long before any of us were even born. And then if you come back to the history even through the civil rights movement, it was the police departments that were used to attack peaceful protesters. It was the police officers who sick dogs on little children and elderly people. When you look at things like Bloody Sunday on the Edmund Pettus Bridge and all of these things. So we have to understand those who are, who are law enforcement who have good hearts, understand there's a history that you may not be, you may not have caused, but because of the badge that you've now put on, you're part of. And so trust has to be earned and built. It's not automatic and it's not assumed. So for those who have good hearts in law enforcement, I would just say, one, understand that trust is not automatic. It does have to be earned. But two, we need their voices. Uh, we need them to acknowledge uh, some of these injustices and not turn a blind eye to it. Do you think you can hold those two truths like police brutality is absolutely unacceptable and needs to be called out and that being an officer like that is also a high calling? I, I do. Um, you know, the scripture says that the powers that be are ordained by God. And so I do believe that law enforcement can be a calling. Um, and so uh, at the same time, I know that there are many people in law enforcement. I saw even some of the videos that we've seen in the last week or so. Some, law, some officers who've knelt with protesters, you know, um, some who even shed tears. Uh, so, you know, I don't demonize all law enforcement. Uh, so for those who view it as a high calling, I would encourage them to treat it as someone who's called to pulpit ministry, would mm -hmm. treat their calling, that it is a high and a holy calling, because at the end of the day, they're responsible for lives as well. Um, that calling to serve and to protect is a serious calling, and, and we should take it and treat it with honor. On, uh, on Monday night, I got an email from Ricky Brown, who, you know, you know, who's also a church planner. Uh -huh. And he said, hey, you want to go with me? And he invited me to this peaceful protest led by um, faith leaders. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was on Tuesday night. And I'd never done something like that. But I was like, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, in some ways, it, it wasn't as big a deal as I thought. <laughs> but uh, I think it was an important event for me personally as a, as a step. And I think hopefully it was encouraging for my friend Ricky. But one thing happened in the middle of uh, the protest. There were a couple guys from the neighborhood who were like running down the side of the street yelling, um, not out of control, they just really wanted us to hear them. And they were, they were yelling, thank you very much. Thank you very much for venturing to the south side. And then they said, but understand, this is not enough. And I think maybe that was, in some ways, kind of my takeaway from that experience. And I'm kind of wrestling with, well, what does that, what does that mean, I mean, for me? So I think that one of the things we have to understand is a mar being at a march, a protest, is a good starting point. But there's a lot of action. So, and I think the other thing is you got to understand why there's some cynicism, why there is a level of uh, almost distrust when you see things like that. because. You, once, sometimes you ask the question, are white folk coming to this because they want to help or is this a way of assuaging white guilt? And so we have to ask that question. I think there's a lot of things that can be done. Um, part of it means not just showing up at marches and protests, but also going back to your own communities. And, you know, I've, I've often heard it. I think some one of the speakers at the protest said to the white leaders and others that were there, don't just come here and tell us how you support black people and you believe that black life should matter as much as anyone else's life uh, or that you know racism is evil, go back to your own communities and say it. 
you know, go back to your own communities and confront some of the systems that have helped create the situations, that have helped create the problems, that have helped create the dynamics, um, that we need your voices uh, on a lot of different levels and on a, on a lot of different fronts, not just at a march. So I think that it means don't stop here. This is a good starting point, but go back and, and, and become a, a partner in this. I think I've come to understand too that I think there's an implicit bias in all of us and that racism is probably on a spectrum mm -hmm. or a continuum. Mm -hmm. And even I'd say personally, there's at least been a, I guess you could say a passive racism because there have been things that happened in my lifetime where I probably should have acted mm -hmm. and done something, but I, but I didn't. Yeah. And even in our prayer, in this series that we're doing, pray like this, you know, it, it, kinda, it concludes with your kingdom come, your will be done yeah. on earth as it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. What's, what's, what, is, what does that mean for this issue? It means a few things for me. When I hear the statement that Jesus said to pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, it means number one, um, we have a mandate to help earth reflect heaven. So if there is no poverty in heaven, we have to work to eradicate poverty on earth. If there's no injustice in heaven, we have to work to eradicate injustice on earth. If there's, if there's no violence in heaven, we have to work to eradicate violence and racism, all of the injustices on earth. So that's one thing that it means to me. The other thing that it means to me is that um, we have to ask ourselves, well, what does heaven look like? And Revelation 7 tells us that there were people from every tribe, every tongue, and every people group gathered around the throne. Now, what's interesting about that is John the Revelator could see distinctions among the people, even around the throne of God, but yet we're so quick to say, well, no, there's no color. God doesn't see color. God does. God created it. God created us different and unique. So this notion of this colorblind God is a myth. And I think a lot of times we say that as a way of dismissing, because if I recognize that I have to see color, then I got to deal with what I see. But if I say, well, God doesn't see color, I can absolve myself of any responsibility to deal with what I rest and wrestle with what I see. So when I hear that kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven, one, it says, what does heaven look like? And how do we work to help earth look like heaven? And, and then how do we make sure that because we're all going to be citizens of the kingdom of heaven, uh, how do we make sure that we live out that kingdom citizenship? That's good. Let, let me ask this too. Do you feel any hope? I mean, because like you said, there's been lots of marches. There's been a series of challenges, issues. But do you feel any hope? I feel hope. Um, right now? Right now. Why is that? I feel hope right now because I believe that in, in a strange way, God is using the George Floyd murder as a tipping point. I believe this nation is at a tipping point. Uh, the racial unrest, uh, although volatile and sometimes violent, it brings us to a tipping point where we have to have conversations that we have been quick to dismiss before. This conversation isn't going away quickly this time. Um, the other reason I have hope is because I believe there's a younger generation coming behind us that is more intentional about calling out racism and injustice. Um, and then the other reason I have hope is because um, people like you and John Dennis and others who showed up to say, you know what, we don't live here. And because it would be easy for you out of Naperville to say, well, you know what, our community is less diverse. We don't really have to deal with this as much. Um, it would be easy to sit on the sidelines. But what I have seen that is different from past marches and, and protests and things is more what I would call white allies who are stepping up to say, how can we help? How can we support? I've gotten more calls and texts from white pastors and other friends to say, is there anything we can do than in past times? So seeing th it seems like there's an acceleration and an intensification of concern and saying, what can we do? So for those reasons, I have hope. Here, here's what I'd love for you to do. Um, so we got, I don't know how many thousands of people that are listening. And we are, um, we got a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds, but uh, percentage-wise, predominantly white. Um, but I would love to have you kind of pastor them. Um, what, what do we, just think of it in two good things. What do we need to know and what would you challenge us to do? So a couple things. One, recognize that um, and I'm gonna make some generalizations here, so again, they may not always apply. Recognize that uh, for those white folk who have black colleagues, coworkers, or friends, or even fellow members, uh, they may not be okay. Um, so check on them without judgment. Just like text, phone call. Text, phone call. How you doing? Give them space to, if they don't wanna talk, respect that. Um, 
rec recognize that they're dealing with emotions that you may not understand right now. Um, and also, they're dealing with a level of frustration and tiredness that you may not understand. Uh, secondly, you know, many times I hear uh, some white folk who, who have good hearts and I believe have good intentions say, you know, well, I just need to learn. And so they want a, a black friend to just teach them everything. That, that can be draining sometimes. Yeah. Because if you're constantly in the position of having to teach and educate all the time, that pulls on you and drains on you. So recognize that your black friend may not feel like teaching at the moment. So give them a minute, let them breathe. and get. So I would just say that. The other thing is look for ways to get involved. Um, look for ways to support. And then also look for way, educate yourself, read books on the subject. Um, and then also revisit the history of this country through another lens. Because what I've discovered is um, most white folk understand the history of this country from a, very, from a different perspective from which I would understand it. So when I hear things like we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men were created equal, for many folks that instills a level of pride and patriotism. But I also recognize the fact that in 1776, my people weren't even considered human, let alone American citizens. So, um, you know, so for me, and, and, and you know, my father considered himself a patriot and he respected this country, but he dealt with the tension of having gone overseas to fight for this country, but coming back and being called the N-word and being disrespected after having fought for this country. So I would say to, to those who, who mean well, educate yourself, uh, but don't flood and inundate, don't expect your black friend to be the teacher all the time. Um, and, and also don't think because you have a black friend, it absolves you of all responsibility. Uh, of this, that there, we have to move from this level of just having, okay, what, well, in order to eradicate racism, I just need a black friend. We have to move to the level of understanding systems, understanding the disparities, healthcare, economics, right? Start doing some research. Understand why uh, black wealth is projected to be, at, the net black wealth of, of families is projected to be at zero dollars by 2050, but that's not the case in white families. Understand those factors. Read on those factors, research those factors, and then ask yourself, well, what can I do about it? And, but then the other thing I would say is when you see instances, both institutional and personal, start calling them out. Author uh, David Foster Wallace, he often will come back to this parable that he tells, and I'll get it roughly right, where there's uh, two young fish swimming along, and then an older fish comes along, and he says to the two young fish, uh, how's the water, boys? And they just keep swimming along, and then pretty soon the two young fish look at each other, and one of them says, what's water? <laughs> and I think the idea is sometimes we're so immersed in it, like we're always in it, that we're not, we don't, we're not even aware that we're in it. Uh, sometimes it's also just called blind spots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would love for you to speak to what are the blind spots you think that maybe are in most white folks' lives, mm -hmm. or even in predominantly white churches, mm -hmm or even culture at large? Well, one of the biggest blind spots is white privilege. And when I use the term white privilege, people sometimes, white folks sometimes get defensive because they say, well, I'm not privileged. You know, I worked hard to get what I have, right? And, and so the privilege is so ingrained in American society and culture that most people don't even see it. It is a blind spot, right? So things like not feeling tense or nervous when the police car is behind you, it's white privilege. Mm -hmm. It's a privilege that I don't enjoy. I'm a middle class black man who's college educated and I still get nervous, right, in moments like that. Uh, not being followed in stores is white privilege. Uh, and so I think the blind spots are, are, are some of the levels in which white privilege works. Uh, you know, black kids, myself included, we're taught as kids, you have to be twice as good, you have to work twice as hard, you have to run twice as fast just to get half as much. And so it is, it is that kind of notion that you have to almost overperform. Uh, you have to be the exception uh, just to even get on an equal playing field. And so I think that uh, some of the, the privilege uh, is, is even, it, it, it transcends some of what people see and understand every day. And, and so going back to these blind spots, I think people are even oblivious to the level of privilege in which they, they have and that, that exist. Um, when you look at economic outcomes and factors, um, there's you no know, that those are privileges that people are are sometimes oblivious to. In what ways? Well, um, you know, right now there's uh, 
economic disparities. So I, I believe the last study I saw was that on average, college educated um, African American men make somewhere around 70 something cents to the dollar of what white men of equal education make. So 70%. Yeah. So, um, and so we're not even talking about gender disparities here. We're talking about just racial, ethnic, apples to apples, right? Uh, so those are, that's, that's a level of privilege. When you look at the criminal justice system, assumptions of innocence, right? So for instance, one of the blind spots of privilege is uh, over the last even five years from the Trayvon Martin case to the Eric Garner case to all the other cases that we've seen uh, of murder, uh, there's an assumption of white innocence that, well, if the officer did that, they must have done something to deserve it, right? So there's almost this assumption that if something bad happens to a black person, they did something to deserve it. Mm -hmm. That's a blind spot, right? Um, the fact that people, uh, people who've never met them assume they did something to deserve what happened to them. Well, that wouldn't happen if it was me. Right. So I, I, you know, I, I think that, for instance, if George Floyd looked like you, that officer having the knee on his neck, people would not have assumed, oh, he must have done something for that officer to, you know. I've seen so many videos of white, okay, one example of white privilege, one of the best examples I've seen of white privilege ever is these protests over the shelter in place orders in states. Where a few weeks ago you had states around the country where armed white men with assault rifles, stormed state capitals, yelled in the face of police, you know, and, and, you know, made all kind of demands. I mean, but there was no physical altercation that happened. That's white privilege. The last time a group of black, um, a black folk stormed a state capitol, not even stormed a state capitol, but showed up at a state capitol with weapons was uh, when the Black Panthers in California went to the California state capitol to protest uh, and they were armed, and then, then Governor Ronald Reagan and the NRA partnered to pass gun, gun control legislation. The only time the NRA has supported gun control. But it was because the, the it was NRA in response supported. to armed black protesters. It was a peaceful protest, but they were armed. But, you know, we see so many times of white militias and other groups protesting with, with weapons, and there's no, no altercation, there's no issue. If you broaden it, beyond even the individual, well, you kind of did already, to let's say the churches then. Yeah. Where, where does that show up for churches? So the church in America has a long history of racism, and one of the things that we ignore often is that many of the religious institutions and denominations in America were complicit in slavery. The, the, if you look at the history of the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, the reason there's a Southern Baptist and American Baptist is because of slavery. Uh, so the Southern Baptist Convention upheld slavery. It upheld the right of their members to own slaves. So uh, where it shows up in modern churches is that many uh, white churches have the luxury of not having to deal with social issues, of not having to deal with these realities, whereas black churches, we don't have that luxury because this is what our members deal with day in and day out, week in and week out. So I call it sometimes the luxury, luxury of ignorance. And I don't mean ignorance in the pejorative sense. I mean ignorance in the sense of, I don't know. I, I, you know, I just, I have the, I have the luxury to say, I don't know about that and I don't have to deal with that. So as a pastor, part of your calling is you have to be on the street last, whatever it was, Wednesday night, protecting black businesses. Um, that hasn't ever happened for me. Right. So, so, you know, one of the things as a pastor, I don't, I, you know, I can't just you know, say I'm going to teach the Bible and pray for people and visit the sick and, you know, bury the dead. I mean, um, part of that means I have to be present and show up in moments of crisis throughout the history of black America. Uh, the church and particularly the clergy have been leaders. When you look at the history of the civil rights movement, most of the, for the leaders at the forefront in the civil rights movement were clergy. Mm -hmm. Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, Reverend Andrew Young. Fred Shuttlesworth, Reverend Jesse Jackson. So, I mean, these were members of the clergy, uh, Reverend Ralph Abernathy. Many, most, many of them were pastors who had their own congregations. So um, the reason that the Montgomery bus boycott was effective is because many of the pastors were shuttling people back and forth mm -hmm. during the time of the bus boycott. So, you know, it wasn't what their white counterparts had to do. So again, there's a luxury there. Over the past several weeks, we've, we've been in a series, and we kind of took a little pause here uh, a series called Pray Like This, mm -hmm. because uh, the disciples went to Jesus and said, teach us how to pray. And he said, okay, pray like this. Um, what are you praying for these days? Jesus has one unanswered prayer. In John 17, he prayed to the Father and said, I pray that they may be one even as we are one. 
and one of my prayers is for the body of Christ that we would be an answer to the prayer that Jesus prayed that has not been answered yet. And I don't know that we will ever see that answer on this side of glory. That's one thing. Other thing that I'm praying for is in, in our interest for my, our communities. I mean, the businesses and many of the stores on the south side of the city were looted and razed and some of them burned. So my prayer is for the recovery and the rebuilding. I, I shared um, this week on a Facebook Live, even during my, one of the corporate prayers I was leading, uh, that God will raise up the Nehemiahs. In Nehemiah 2, verses uh, 17, 18, 19, he, it's how, he talked to the people and he said, listen, you see the trouble we're in. Three things he said to them. You see the trouble we're in, the gates are burned, and the wall is torn down. Mm. Now let us go and rebuild. Uh, and I look at our, the city of Chicago, uh, particularly the south and west side of the city, and, and I see the trouble we're in. There's some stuff that's been burned and some stuff that's been torn down. Mm -hmm. And so my prayer is that the Lord would raise up some Nehemiahs in this season who will go about the work of rebuilding uh, and rebuild it in a better way. So, I mean, if there's Nehemiahs that are, that are watching here and would like to help you with that, I mean, they can email me. Absolutely. Um, they get an email from me whether they like it or not every week, at least once a week. <laughs> Definitely. And they can email me and I can put them in touch with you. And maybe there is some ways that we can become uh, the answer to John, uh, Jesus' prayer in John Absolutely. 17. Absolutely. And there's also some relief funds that were set up for businesses. So I would just say, research some of those. Um, there's, a, there's actually some listings, and I'll, I'll make sure I post some on my social media. Uh, you know, a number of like uh, black restaurants and other businesses in these communities uh, that it's important more, now more than ever to support them. You know what, Q, thank you very much. Absolutely, my Seriously, pleasure. this has been uh, personally helpful, I mean, for me, and uh, hopefully also for, for our church community. I hope so. I, I, would, I would love it if you would. Maybe, um, maybe I could say a prayer. Sure. And then you could say a closing prayer. Definitely. Right. My pleasure. Father God, I want to say, uh, I, was, I guess first of all, I, just want to, I, I do want to uh, just kind of repent for those times where action should have been taken and it wasn't taken. Or things should have been prioritized that weren't prioritized around, around this injustice. And um, I ask that personally you help me know how to lead. I ask that you also help uh, the folks in our church, many who have influence and affluence. I ask that you help them to know how to leverage that for, uh, for your kingdom's purposes. And um, this is our prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for my friend and brother, Dave Ferguson, and thank you for the people of Community Christian Church who are entering into a complex, a nuanced, and even an uncomfortable conversation. But I pray, God, that you would give them the courage to continue this conversation, but not just stop at conversation, but God, give them wisdom and clarity on how to move into action. God, give them ideas and ways in which they can plug in. God, we thank you that you love us all, and God, you created us all uniquely. Your word tells us that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. But God, we thank you that even in the midst of all the chaos that's going on right now, you have a will and you have a plan and you have a desire to see people liberated and to see people walk in love. Jesus, we pray that we would not only know you as Savior, but we would also know you as liberator. We pray right now that you would give us your wisdom and um, just show us the path forward with courage and with boldness and with faith. In Jesus' name, amen.